In the previous video, we introduced what an algorithm is and what a data structure is. Um, and we gave an example of a sorting algorithm as a particular algorithm. Um, but one question you might think is, or one thought you might have is, well, a sorting algorithm, it can be implemented in various different ways. Um, and some are more or less efficient, assuming that there's no errors in the logic that solve um, the task at hand. Um, but how do we actually measure like precisely how one algorithm is better than another? Um, and how we do so is we consider the space and time complexity. So the space complexity, it refers to how much memory has been used to be able to solve the particular problem you're working on. And the time complexity is often more the focus when solving questions, uh, but that doesn't mean we should neglect uh, memory allocation. Um, and time complexity refers to how fast our um, how fast our algorithm runs. So we'll dive deeper into measuring efficiency with big O notation and complexity analysis and that sort of stuff in the next video. Um, but to be able to understand that, you have to understand how memory works um, because memory underpins um, space and time complexity. So whenever we're declaring a variable, in our program. For example, let's say we have a constant variable uh, x and we'll let that equal to 5 for example, doesn't really matter. Um, basically what we're doing is we're declaring a variable and we're storing that data in memory. And when we're talking about memory, we're talking about RAM and not disk storage. And I find the easiest way to conceptualize memory is to think of this grid here, which has uh, rows and columns. And each cell uh, represents a memory slot. So here we've got 16 starting from the index zero. Um, now in your computer, there's gonna be more slots um, and this is a bit of an oversimplification, um, but the computer can very, very quickly access memory slots. So if you've declared this variable const x equals five, um, it goes to the first free slot. So in this case, we'll go to uh, this zero index here and you have a value of five in here. And then there's sort of like a some machinery um, that sort of finds the column, uh, finds the row, and it finds the cell that you're looking for. And then it can get the number like that. Now we're not gonna go into the computer hardware side of things or computer architecture, and we're gonna make some simplifications here. Um, but essentially the thing to note is you do have a fixed amount of memory. So even though computers uh, have a lot more memory than they used to, there still is a fixed amount. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, <clears throat> what each memory slot holds, um, it holds a byte. So we can say one byte. And if you haven't came across what a byte is before, uh, it's more or less, it's equal to eight bits. Um, so a bit is simply just a zero or one value. It's a binary value. And one of the simplest, um, data structures you can have, um, is just a variable that tells you if it's a Boolean or not. So you could have a one or a zero and you only need one bit for that bit of information. So zero is off, one's on or zero being false or falsey and one being truthy. Um, so, and in physical terms, uh, it detects, you know, some voltage. I think it's five volts or zero volts, uh, but it could be uh, not precisely that. 
but it detects if an electric signal is detected or not. So natural computer hardware, you've got electrical components and transistors, and if there is some voltage detected, um, they'll indicate, or they'll flip the bit to being either a zero or one. So we've sort of already just seen and uncovered the Boolean uh, data structure there. Um, but we're looking at a number here. So <clears throat> basically, and we mentioned this before, but we're going to have multiple lines of code uh, that's declaring all sorts of variables. Now, this just happens to be the first variable here. Um, but let's say that this was in the zeroth spot and we declared another variable, then it would go to the next available slot which is this first index here. So let's say we want to store the number 128. So let me just change this number here to, and I'll do it in white. So rather than having five here, let's say we want to change that to the number 128 here. So basically, our computer can only recognize ones and zeros. So we need to know how to count in binary. And the number one, uh, well, firstly, the number zero in binary um, is just going to be zero. The number one is just going to be the number one, so no surprises here. Um, but then the number two, um, we've only got two numbers to represent it. So unlike our um, decimal system that we got that goes to 10, so we've got the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then it repeats the numbers by adding a zero. So then one plus the zero is the next uh, increment up or the base to go up from um, two. Um, we have a zero in the ones column, um, and then we have a twos column here. Um, so essentially, if I have the number, say, um, 128, well, that's a nice power of two, and it's been chosen, um, you know, with intention. Um, so there's zero ones, zero twos, zero fours, zero eights, zero sixteens, uh, zero thirty twos, zero sixty fours. I've just run out of space here, but then there's one, uh, 128. So you notice that this number here is two to the power of zero. This is two to the power of one, which we can see is in the two. Um, and then we work our way up and we've got an eight bit number or one byte here. So this number here, this is going to be in the one, this is going to be the two to the power of seven. And then basically, um, it's just going to have combinations of that. So if you're not sure, hopefully that was a good refresher of binary. Um, but if you're not sure, you may want to watch another video on counting in binary. Um, because it is it, it underpins uh, memory, basically. As you could imagine, if you only have zeros or ones to represent things. Um, <clears throat> so there's a few things. What happens if you have, say, a negative number? Well... A negative number, sort of like a Boolean, is just a one byte um, memory access. So one could denote whether it's positive and zero could denote uh, whether it's negative or vice versa, but you only need one bit more of information there. Um, but more um, importantly, or, or you know, you might be thinking, well, if each slot only can take eight bytes what happens if you have a number bigger than 128 because you know we're going to deal with numbers bigger than 128 um 
And essentially what we do in that situation is, oh, and to conclude this 128 here, basically what we'll do is we'll um, have a, we'll look for the next free bit of memory and then we'll put the 128 here. So I'm just going to write it um, like this, one, two, eight. But know that this is in binary here. So it's actually going to be stored in the memory slot like this uh, 1000000 000 000 000 number here. Um, one more thing to note is I've got this index here of 0 and 1 and 2. Um, and that, I believe, um, isn't completely accurate, but hopefully it's given a good indication and simplification. But basically, if you ever used a program languaging like, like C or something like that, um, you're going to have uh, what's known as pointers. Um, so this variable here, 128, this is stored in the memory slot in here, 0. Um, but this would actually refer to a memory address. Now, in TypeScript, we don't really deal with memory addresses directly, uh, but it is something to keep in mind. Um, and we'll extend our discussion on that in when we're talking about arrays and strings, perhaps. Um, but for this uh, particular video where we're interesting, introducing memory, um, <clears throat> we can just uh, simplify things a bit here. Um, but we do have the question, which is what happens if we have a number bigger than 128? So let's say we had 129 or 1,000. It doesn't really matter what the number is. We just know that it's bigger than 128. Well, we've already got 128 in this slot, so we're going to need to look for the next free spot in memory, which is going to be here. Um, but the memory isn't going to fit in here. So rather than just looking for the next one free memory slot, we're looking for the next more, the, the number of memory slots that we need. So if it's the number 129, we're going to need two memory slots to uh, count that. So we're going to need to <clears throat> look for a one and a two. Um, and as you're writing your program, you might think, well, wouldn't they always be these memory slots always be next to each other. Um, and for these simple cases, that's that's true. But, um, you know, you could imagine that sometimes your memory gets freed up, uh, which is another thing that TypeScript doesn't... Um, it hides behind the scene for you in terms of, you know, garbage collection and stuff like that, like in Java, um, compared to C where you need to free your own memory. And you can start to see why... Um, those slower level languages are more efficient um, because in TypeScript and you, you can only really declare a number um, whereas in languages like Java you can declare a long number or a floating number and then you can specify the number of bits that you actually want to um, you know use up and then you've got to um, well in Java you rely on the garbage collector but in other languages you've got to free up your memory uh, when needed um, but TypeScript is a bit of a simplification of that. Um, but in exchange for the language not being quite as efficient, um, well, it's firstly, it's the only language that compiles uh, nicely into JavaScript, which is the only language used in the browser, other than some special edge cases that no one is using currently, like WASM and stuff like that, WebAssembly. Um, but... Uh, it's also easier to write, so that's the trade-off usually. Um, and big companies are usually heading more to that sort of direction where, you know, they're using languages like JavaScript, Python, these really popular um, languages that you'll see. Uh, it also makes writing the algorithm easier and passing the algorithm tests. Um, and it's only when you actually get into the company that you need to focus on um, you know, if you've got some heavy back-end work like image processing and stuff like that, then, you know, you'd pull out the big guns and pull out the C languages and languages like that. But uh, for the most part, we can use these high-level languages here nicely. 
um, but it is important to be aware of that. And, and intuitively, you probably already know that, but it, this just really, um, you know, paints the picture of exactly why. So hopefully it puts the pieces together and everything sort of just clicks in your mind nicely. Um, so yes, we can come to the next three spots here. And if you do have arrays or other stuff and memory gets cleared, you know, this spot might be free, but then this spot isn't, but then you don't have enough spots. So the computer is able to easily um, do that. And then we'll probably look for this four and five spot in that case. But let's say we had another 129. Well, we're going to need another one byte here. And we do have to use a byte to represent it because each cell is a byte. So even though we only need nine bits, we can't use like a partition of this you know, one eighth of this cell. So we ended up just using the whole cell there. Um, so the binary number representing 129 will be stored in these two cells here. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we've seen how booleans and numbers and negative numbers um, can be stored at a higher level. Um, but what about other data structures? Like, a string or an array or an object well we'll come back to these data structures um, as needed as well as some other custom data structures but for now the main point to realize is that variables take up memory and they're stored in binary in our RAM and the less memory we use the better our space complexity will be so that's important when tackling these algorithm questions is you want to choose the right data structure um, to help maximize both your space complexity or minimize the space complexity and get the most uh, time efficient solution based on that data. So we're going to start seeing some of this um, when we implement some data structures and algorithms. Um, so you may start to see why languages like C are more performant than languages like JavaScript for the aforementioned reasons, um, mainly due to having finer grain control over the amount of memory we're allocating um, in these lower level languages. Um, but choosing the right data structure and minimizing the amount of storage used is important but perhaps more important, and particularly in the context of these coding interviews, is how fast your algorithm can run. So in the next video, we'll cover everything you need to know about measuring your code's efficiency, and then we'll be in a good position to dive into our first data structure. So thanks for watching. Cheers, and I'll see you in the next video.